Boris Johnson proudly declared Glasgow will forevermore be spoken in the same breath as Kyoto and Paris, the moment when the world makes a great leap forward in stopping global warming. Will Glasgow still be that big moment, do you think? It's going to be a really tough job. It's going to be touch and go to get there. Um, it's very ambitious to um, get all the countries, there's 120, more than 120 world leaders attending, 195 countries represented. Uh, literally, as you rightly point out, the conference started just eight minutes ago. Um, we've got very big ambitions for this, but it's a little bit too early to tell. I know what I do know is the Prime Minister, uh, uh, Boris Johnson, Alex Sharma, uh, Kwasi Kwarteng, the whole rest of the team will be working absolutely flat out and to get people to fulfill the agreement that they signed up to in Paris six years ago. Do you share the United Nations Secretary General's fear that there's a serious risk that Glasgow won't deliver because of the weakness in the commitments that have been made so far? I think he said that they're so far on the track run at the moment, we're going to condemn the world to 2.7 degrees to see by the end of the century. Well, we're working very hard on this, Paul. Uh, we've got in the year that the UK has been the chair designate, so effectively running this uh, under Alok Sharma, um, we've got uh, the world to sign up significantly more. At the start of the year, just 30% of the world's economy was signed up to net zero commitments. Now that figure is 80%. Uh, you're right that we haven't reached uh, what the 1.5%, uh, sorry, the 1.5 degrees at a magic figure. Um, but five or six years ago, we were looking at a plus six degree uh, increase uh, in, 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 in global temperatures. Uh, we're heading there. You know, we're heading to a good place, but there's a lot of, lot of hard work uh, still to be done and will be done by the Prime Minister and by others. Um, and particularly in the next two days for the Leaders' Summit part of the COP conference. Now, members of the public watching COP will be wondering just what is a metric of success? What, what is the sign of success? So could you try and help us a bit here? I mean, one metric of success would be seeing pledges for specific amounts of a global tonnage of harmful emissions in the atmosphere reduce, a specific number of tonnes that you're going to cut. Uh, there's this thing called the emissions gap, um, and it's the UN's top concern. The gap seems to be uh, quite large, but so far the planet has only, or governments have only planned, uh, pledged 4 billion and 28 billion tonnes need to be actually added. Uh, are you going to try and get that tonnage as a specific outcome of this talk? Well, look, uh, in terms of the specific outcomes, we what we want to do is to uh, keep that magic 1.5 degrees Celsius target alive. Uh, that is, if you like, the overall uh, objective uh, as the um, so uh, other targets would need to be consistent uh, with that, uh, ideally below two degrees Celsius, so definitely below two degrees Celsius, ideally uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius. I think the way, if you like, in terms of like how people can understand how we do that, I think the prime minister sums it up really in four words, um, coal, cars, cash and trees. Um, so coal, making sure that in the developed world, uh, coal is phased out by the year 2030, in the developing world by 2040. Uh, cars, making sure that we move or eliminate uh, polluting vehicles. Uh, as you know, in the UK, uh, we've got a strong commitment there to uh, eliminating um, um, diesel cars and vans uh, in the next decade. Uh, cash, uh, providing a hundred billion US dollar equivalent of climate finance from the developed world to, to, to the developing world, recognizing the climate adapta adaptation is going to cost money. And then finally on trees, um, to make sure that we halt deforestation by 2030. Um, so that, if you like, is the, the, the key target is the 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, how we get there, uh, I would say, is best put through coal, cars, cash and trees, um, which, if you like, is the catchy way of seeing how we get there. Now, it's a nice soundbite, but in terms of actual measuring success of this summit, I mean, would you like, for example, some countries to join Britain in, in actually announcing that they're going to have um, a, a target date for, for um, not selling more diesel and petrol cars, for example? China, for example, uh, could easily do that, we're told, but it hasn't committed to it publicly. Would you like to see them do that? Well, I think we'd like to see as many countries as possible uh, sign up to a phasing out of polluting vehicles. Uh, that is absolutely an objective uh, of this summit. Uh, I'm not defining particular countries setting particular dates at this point. 
um, but uh, it, it, it'll all be uh, visible through countries' nationally determined contributions uh, as well. Uh, but that is one of the key objectives, is getting um, people signing up to uh, eliminating polluting cars and vans in particular uh, from the roads uh, um, going forward. Uh, 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 and that includes China as much as it does other countries. Now, um, Greg, obviously trade has been your background um, in government and um, as well as energy and climate change. One thing the government could do, which some are already pushing for, is push for a carbon tax on high emission intensive imports. Um, how intensively is Britain looking at that as an option? The EU have talked about it. John Kerry's talked about it. Um, the idea that somehow we need to level the playing field between, you know, those countries that are producing goods in a dirty way uh, and countries like us and others that are trying their best? Well, we're looking at this closely, Paul. Um, it's not specifically on the agenda directly um, at COP. Um, I think it's something which will, I'm sure, be discussed at the World Trade Organization uh, at their ministerial conference coming up in about a month's time. Uh, I think for these things, we've got to make sure that carbon border adjustment mechanisms aren't a form of protectionism. Um, and that's why I think it's important that the WCO, that the whatever is done is made uh, compatible with the World Trade Organization. We have to make sure that such mechanisms do not sort of discriminate against uh, the developing world uh, in particular. So make sure that they just not a, another form of the developed world sort of closing our markets to uh, imports from developing countries. Um, so I think there's quite a few hoops for that to go through first. Um, but the UK is, is of course, watching very closely uh, what is being uh, proposed uh, around the world in terms of this. I mean, it's a very, very real issue, of course. Uh, there's no point in you know, ending uh, polluting industries in this country if they, uh, those industries then either move offshore or they just allow um, polluting industries in, in other countries to sell their products into us. But equally, we've got to make sure that it's compatible with global trade rules. I mean, the global economy is going to be very dependent on trade uh, in the coming decades. And we need to make sure, obviously, the UK is strongly committed to the rules based international system, uh, particularly when it comes to trade in the World Trade Organization. We need to make sure that whatever rules are done are compatible uh, with free trade around the world as well. Um, you know, that, that is it's a really, really interesting area, uh, fast developing. Uh, we've just got to make sure that um, that uh, the WCO, I think, is probably the right place to be looking at this at the moment. And I was going to ask you, actually, what about the issue of legally binding targets? And obviously, Britain has bound itself to some legal targets and, and the very ambitious ones. But what do you say to countries like Australia, who've made promises in the last few days, but none of them are legally binding and they could easily be wriggled out of? Well, Australia, I mean, uh, the, the Paris Agreement, of course, is an international treaty. Um, secondly, uh, Australia has actually got a good record of, um, of delivering uh, on its commitments. Um, they uh, uh, historically in the last uh, 10, 15 years have actually delivered quite well on their agreements. So I'm pleased that Australia has signed up to be net zero by 2050. Uh, Scott Morrison is one of the important leaders coming to Glasgow um, um, for the conference. It's really good of him to be there. Uh, as you know, Paul, our relationship with Australia is very strong um, and uh, we will be looking, we welcome very much Australia's uh, new commitment to be net zero by 2050. We think it sends a really important signal across the developed world. I mean, worth remembering, 80% of emissions are caused by G20 nations. Um, so making sure that the G20 um, sign up to net zero, uh, I think is going to be an absolutely vital part of delivering it uh, by the middle of the century. Now, you just made a very good point about the, the G20 making up the vast bulk of the emissions. Um, what do you make of the, the argument that the Chinese have come up with in recent days? They've repeated the argument that the, the richer Western countries are the ones that have, are responsible for the bulk of this historic um, uh, amount of greenhouse gas in, in, in the planet's atmosphere. There is a counter case, there isn't there, which is that actually in the last 25 years, I think nearly half of the emissions have remarkably come from countries that have uh, uh, produced uh, greenhouse gases in in very recent times, including China. So they bear some responsibility too, don't they? Well, I think, uh, to be fair, Paul, I think the whole world bears uh, a certain amount of responsibility. There's not really too much point 
um, given um, the emergency that we're in and, and kind of apportioning blame, you know, we've all got to work together uh, and do something about it and make more progress and more progress more quickly. That's exactly uh, why we're having um, the COP26 summit. Uh, and that's why you know, the UK, Boris Johnson, the whole team will be uh, pushing hard to get uh, international agreement on this because uh, the, you know, the UK, we are only 1% of global emissions. Um, but, you know, we are, if you like, an opinion leader in this space. The UK, when we published our net zero strategy ourselves uh, just two weeks ago, uh, I think mapped out how the UK is going to get to net zero. We can be a big influence in this area, but we really need everybody working together. Um, it is a, a world issue um, and it needs a worldwide solution. Uh, so I'm not in the business of apportioning any blame. Uh, but we do need to get, in particular, uh, the biggest polluters, which is principally uh, the G20, 80% uh, of the world's uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We do need to get as really all of them signed up to get to net zero. Now, the Prime Minister has uh, revealed this weekend um, that he lobbied President Xi to bring the 2030 peak for, for Chinese emissions closer to 2025. How realistic do you think we're going to get some kind of announcement from China on that? Well, I, I can't really comment on sort of specific country to country negotiations, uh, particularly as the as the summit has only just uh, started. Um, but clearly, we do want um, the um, biggest polluters um, to uh, set an example uh, and take action, take tough action um, for the rest of the world. That, that's absolutely uh, crucial in all of this. So yeah. I, I don't think we should be at all surprised that we're putting pressure on the biggest polluters uh, to do more. And now one consolation prize that might come out of this whole summit um, is that actually that the, the world agrees to come back a bit quicker. It accelerates the, the review mechanism, the so-called ratcheting uh, involved in, in the whole review of climate change emissions. And instead of having another meeting in another five years time in 2025, they could have a meeting in 2023. And that's a, a live possibility. Um, how optimistic are you that there could be agreement at least on that? Well, again, Paul, I, I don't know that that's the, 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 these are aspects of what is effectively, you know, now a live negotiation. Um, I think from a UK perspective, you know, we will um, take a holistic view of the whole process um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and look to move that forward in the most effective way possible. Um, we're taking over. I mean, there is an annual COP, as you know, uh, Chile is just handing over to us. We might be handing over to Egypt. That's not yet been decided um, for next year. Um, typically, as I understand, the process has worked every five years. There is a, uh, you know, a, a really a, a bigger effort, a bigger uh, um, progress update, which is exactly what this one is in Glasgow. Uh, whether you know th that should be done more frequently or not, I think that's really a matter for Alok Sharma and for the negotiations. Now, Greg, when you were last on TNG, you confess you still have a gas boiler and you don't have adequate insulation in your house. Um, have you done anything to sort of tackle either of those? Well, no, I'm waiting, uh, which I think is the right thing to do. That's what the government wants people to do. Uh, for That's why we set a 15-year period for gas boiler replacements. Uh, we're not asking people to you know, go out tomorrow and replace their gas boiler. I mean, we've done it, if you like, at a time when a, a gas boiler's life will naturally end. Um, so that is what I'm expecting to do, uh, rather than immediate action when my gas boiler reaches the end of its natural life uh, to be replaced uh, by a heat pump. What I would say is that in reaction to the net zero strategy, uh, a lot of the energy companies have reacted extremely favorably and have said that heat pumps should be made uh, a lot cheaper. Uh, and thanks in many ways to the government support and the government kickstarting um, that side of, uh, of, of household energy, um, that actually heat pumps should become much cheaper. I think Octopus Energy, I'm not particularly singling out Octopus, I think others have said the same, um, that they should be able to make heat pumps an equivalent price to gas boilers uh, by next April. The government, as we know, has put in £450 million uh, to support this process. But it, it, the idea is not that everybody has to go out tomorrow um, get rid of their gas boiler, particularly if it's relatively new, and buy a heat pump. The idea is to be a 15-year uh, gradual transition um, from uh, gas boilers to heat pumps, and or indeed other low-carbon or zero-carbon options. 
There are other individual changes that people could make. I mean, Prince Charles has suggested, for example, he's eating less red meat. Um, Alok Sharma has revealed this weekend that his, his vegetarian daughter has persuaded him to go vegetarian. Are you thinking of um, um, personal changes along those lines? Are you going to eat less red meat? Well, uh, you know, I, I haven't. Um, but, you know, everybody has to do make their own uh, individual contribution um, based on um, their circumstances. I mean, what I can say is that I, I, I hadn't driven a car or owned a car or operated a car uh, for almost um, 30 years. Um, we all have to make our own judgment. Is that a deliberate uh, choice or is that mainly because you live in London and it's it's easier? Well, I haven't lived in London all of that time. Um, um, uh, it, it is easier. In, in London, it can be difficult to own or operate a car. Um, but equally, um, when leaving London or going outside of London, a, a car is often useful. Um, but um, it's, uh, I find public transport uh, very accessible, very usable, personally, even with a, even with a family. Um, but not everybody does. You know, if you're um, living in a more remote area, a countryside area, you, know, you may not have that necessary public transport. So I think we all have to base our decisions based on our individual circumstances. Uh, I think in my adult life, though, um, uh, uh, UK emissions, don't forget, we've reduced in this country our emissions by 44 percent in my ad mine and your adult lifetime, Paul, in the last 30 years. Um, so the UK has generally done a pretty good job of reducing our contribution to climate change. We need to get that to net zero by 2050 and end the UK's contribution. So I think a lot of people have been making very, very good contributions, uh, particularly the energy generation sector. Uh, if I might add. But ultimately, it'd be down to individuals based on their circumstances uh, to make the contribution that they see fit. Now, can I ask you a little bit about a, a, an item more close to home than perhaps the, the global climate issue, which is about France and uh, the fishing row? Um, do you think France will go ahead with lots of its threats or are they just bluffing? Well, I think it's a question better, better put to France. But, um, uh, but I think the UK and France, look, we are. I know the relationship well, and we are old friends. We're um, partners across uh, almost everything. Um, and particularly um, this week, I expect to see uh, Boris Johnson and Emmanuel Macron working very well together on um, uh, in Glasgow and meeting our climate change obligations. Um, I both think both the UK and France are in pretty much the same place there. Um, so I expect uh, the working together to be very strong um, over the coming couple of weeks at COP. And I think we've just heard from uh, uh, breaking news that Macron has announced a sort of de-escalation of that row. So maybe you're you're in, in the know there, Greg. Um, can I ask you a little bit about the budget? Now, um, the UK, obviously, um, is, the whole point of getting towards net zero is you've got to put your money where your mouth is. Um, there were a lot of people who suggested actually the budget wasn't very green, that the reduction in APD for passenger fuel, passenger flights and also fuels duty being frozen were the wrong messages. Um, do you think that actually that the government needs to be a bit more joined up? Well, uh, don't forget, Paul, we had just announced the previous week a lot of government spending in relation to the net zero strategy. Um, you know, I've already mentioned the, um, the, uh, the, the boiler conversion scheme, the 450 million there, part of about of a 4 billion package on, uh, on, on household energy improvements. So there have actually been a lot of announcements the previous week in the net zero strategy. Yeah. In terms of government spending on, on, on uh, in terms of the air passenger duty increase, don't forget we've also increased the rate of air passenger duty for long haul flights more than five and a half thousand miles in length. Uh, and those are the, you know, those are some of the biggest polluters. Actually, domestic aviation is less than 1% of the UK's uh, emissions overall. So it's a relatively small but important sector, e.g. for the union and making sure that uh, travel to and from Northern Ireland in particular. Uh, remains uh, but viable. One, one thing that was missing from the budget was any uh, suggestion of what we've been waiting for, uh, which is some extra help for people to be protected from energy prices. Um, that we were told a couple of weeks ago that Bayes and uh, the, the Treasury were in talks about an, an extra possible amount of help, whether it was grants or loans to businesses and or individuals. What's happened to that? Are we expecting something soon? But what we've got, Paul, there's, there's, there's a number of separate issues there in, in your question. One is the uh, protection for consumers from 
uh, rising global energy prices. And that is exactly why we have the energy price cap in place, um, which uh, is most um, um, tariffs being offered at the moment by the energy companies or at or, or close to the energy price cap. So we've, we've come in and we've protected consumers with that energy price cap. In terms of the industries, energy intensive industries, we have a good package of support in place already uh, for energy intensive industries. Uh, but obviously it's a situation which the government is watching uh, all the time uh, because we have an unprecedented um, spike in uh, global energy prices, particularly in gas. Um, and uh, we need to be watching that situation uh, very closely. Prices came down last week, but they're still you know, much higher than uh, would normally be the case at this time. A lot of that is driven by the world's very quick, uh, thankfully, a quick uh, recovery from the pandemic. Uh, global growth is taking off. Uh, the UK, by the way, is reckoned to be um, the fastest growing G7 economy this year and next year. So we're very much part of that growth. Um, but that has led to an increase in global energy prices, uh, which uh, we need to make sure that the, the effects uh, on the domestic situation are, are met through, for example, the, um, the energy price cap for consumers uh, and the existing support for energy intensive industries. And Greg, while I've got you, can I ask you a final one, which is a COVID related one? We're seeing a poll today suggesting that many more people have started shaking hands again. Uh, have you started shaking hands again? Uh, that's a good question, Paul. Uh, I greeted um, a visiting train uh, yesterday at St Pancras um, for, uh, is actually the climate train on its way to Glasgow from Amsterdam. Um, and uh, I generally didn't shake hands. I have to say if somebody gave me their hand, uh, as you know, with uh, um, um, uh, some cultures, it, it's difficult to say no to a, to a hand outstretched. So I think I follow the policy. If somebody gave me their hand, I shook it. If they didn't, I didn't, uh, if you like. So I kind of, uh, I think we all have to um, make those um, decisions. Um, I, I'm very much uh, strongly in favor of uh, um, doing things that uh, are shown to be really effective, like uh, mask wearing, uh, FFP2 mask wearing in particular, some of the but, more advanced But there's no, there's no official advice on handshaking as such. I'm not aware of no. any official advice no. on handshake. No. Brilliant.